Around 48 million years ago, in a warm subtropical forest in what's now Germany, zombies were on the march. These zombies were ants, and their bodies and behavior were no longer under their control. They had become infected with the spores of a fungus that was now growing inside them. This fungus was actually manipulating their movements, forcing them to do something they'd never ordinarily do, something strange and specific. The ants abandoned their colony, climbed up a nearby plant onto the underside of one of its leaves, and bit down hard on the leaf's veins, locking themselves into place. This behavior is known as the death grip, and as the name suggests, it's the last thing these ants would ever do. Soon the fungus sprouted, probably from their heads, releasing spores to infect new hosts and continue the cycle. All that was left behind were the marks on that ancient leaf. It fossilized and was published in 2011, complete with a distinctive death grip scars. This single fossil leaf is the oldest known evidence of zombified ants, which still exist today. Modern zombie ants even perform the exact same death grip behavior, something healthy ants never do. So we know that this creepy capability to manipulate behavior is ancient, but how and why did it come to exist in the first place? Well, it turns out the fungus's ability to turn ants into the walking dead may have evolved as a response to the development of an equally complex behavior of the ants themselves, a thing called social immunity. Over hundreds of millions of years, many fungi have become specialized for infecting insects and other arthropods. Generally, it happens like this. A fungal spore will attach to a host, penetrate its exoskeleton, and start growing within its body. Eventually, when the fungus is ready, it erupts from the host and releases spores to find and infect new victims. And if you're an old school sci-fi fan like I am, then I know exactly what you're thinking, and you are right. These fungi are basically xenomorphs, and the insects that they infect are like human space colonists whose last moments will be watching parasites explode out of their bodies. The insects have it a little better, I guess, because they're dead before the xenomorph pops out. Anyway, only some fungi have worked behavioral manipulation, aka zombification, into this cycle. And none of them infect people, so don't worry. Probably because they're adapted for infecting arthropods specifically, which makes it really hard for them to jump to other animals. In any case, the most well-known of these fungal puppet masters are probably the species of Ophiocordyceps that infect and manipulate ants. And this manipulation has become incredibly fine-tuned over evolutionary time. When the ants are forced to death grip on the undersides of leaves, they do it at a specific height, around 25 centimeters above the ground, and at a specific time of day, when the sun is highest. This is probably to ensure optimal temperature and humidity for the reproductive part of the fungi to erupt and spread its spores, which fungi often need very particular conditions to do. Positioning the ants on the underside of a leaf might also give the growing fungi protection from UV damage and rain. And directing the ants to bite down around noon might ensure that, by the time they die hours later, the fungi can begin to emerge at night when it's cooler. Researchers have even found evidence that these fungi have tweaked their strategy over millions of years to keep up with their changing environments. See, leaf biting is the typical behavior of zombified ants in tropical forests dominated by evergreen plants. But in temperate forests filled with deciduous plants, which shed their leaves, zombified ants almost always perform their death grip on twigs and bark instead. To dig into this difference, researchers sampled DNA from Ophiocordyceps fungi that infect ants from as many locations as they could, including both temperate and tropical species. Then they used that data to create a family tree for these fungi, mapping out the evolutionary relationships between the different species based on their genetic similarity. And this family tree suggested that, while leaf biting is the ancestral trait, the shift to biting twigs and bark evolved convergently at least four times between 20 and 40 million years ago. The researchers hypothesized that this was the result of changes in climate and environment that occurred over that period. Because around 47 million years ago, in the mid-Eocene epoch, when that fossil leaf from Germany dates to, the world was a much warmer place and had less seasonal change. Back then, evergreen forests went from the equator to the far north and south, even approaching the poles. So it makes sense that, as the study suggested, manipulating ants to lock onto leaves would have been the original strategy. But as the climate cooled during the late Eocene, tropical and subtropical evergreen forests were gradually replaced by temperate deciduous forests at northern and southern latitudes. Zombified ants that only gripped onto leaves in these regions would have fallen to the forest floor when the leaves were shed. And because the fungus seems to have pretty picky requirements when it comes to temperature and humidity, this would have been a major problem. One that provided a pretty strong selective pressure for ensuring that the ants bit onto something a little more secure. Okay, but why did such a complex ability evolve in the fungi in the first place? I mean, this seems like a really complicated way for a little fungus to reproduce. Why not just release your spores into the air and call it a day? That's what I would do. 
Well, the fossil record doesn't really give us a clear answer. The oldest known example of a fungus parasitizing ants is an ant trapped in amber dated to between 45 and 55 million years ago. And it clearly shows a fungus erupting from the ant's body, specifically from its butt, which is probably the most embarrassing way you could be immortalized for eternity. That's high on the list of ways I did not want to go. As amazing as this fossil is though, it can't really tell us how or even if the fungus was controlling the ant's behavior back then. It might have just infected and killed the ant without manipulating its behavior, like many species do today. But we can use DNA, again, to give us insights into the history of ant zombification, this time right back to its origins. In a paper published in 2019, a team of researchers analyzed the DNA of over 600 species within the order of fungi to which Ophiocordyceps belongs. This more extensive family tree suggested that the modern group of Ophiocordyceps that zombifies ants can trace its origins to an ancestor that infected beetle larvae. Now, Ophiocordyceps infect many species of beetle today, but those fungi don't manipulate the behavior of their hosts at all. So the researchers hypothesized that what led to the emergence of zombification was the fact that the fungi switched hosts from solitary beetles to insects like ants and wasps because, and this is the important part, those insects are more social. Highly social insects, like ants, have some impressive group strategies to defend themselves against pathogens. And one of those defenses is what's known as social immunity, the collective defenses against disease that have developed within social groups, like ant colonies. See, ants live in very close quarters and don't have much genetic diversity within a colony, and those are perfect conditions for the spread of pathogens. So a pretty strictly enforced public health system has evolved to keep the colony safe. Ants groom each other to clean off spores, quickly remove or destroy dead bodies, and if an individual shows signs of infection, they're often kicked out of the colony or even killed. And this system of social immunity is pretty effective at stopping the growth of fungus from hosts that die inside the colony. It takes hours to days after the host dies for the fungus to emerge and disperse its spores, and by then the ants have usually destroyed or discarded the corpse. But by manipulating the host to leave the colony and die at a spot nearby instead, usually close to a busy foraging trail, the fungi could evade the colony's social immunity. And this would ensure that there'd be enough time and the right conditions to emerge. Now, there are still many mysteries to be solved surrounding zombie ant fungi, like how exactly they take control of their hosts to manipulate their behavior. We just don't know how they do that. But this ability clearly has ancient roots, stretching back tens of millions of years. Over that time, it's changed to suit the fungi's changing environment as well as their changing hosts. And it's this ongoing arms race between pathogen and host that seems to have led to the emergence of zombification in the first place as the perfect counter to a complex behavioral defense. Which is pretty messed up when you think about it. I mean, all the ants wanted was to keep their colony free of disease. And instead, they got zombies. Okay, just to let you know, we are going on a quick summer break. So this is The Last of Us you'll see for about a month. But while we're away, be sure to check out our episode When Ants Domesticated Fungi to learn about a much less horrible ant-fungus relationship. And I'm antsy to thank this month's eontologists. <laughs> Annie and Eric Higgins, Chase Archambault, Colton, Jake Hart, John Davidson Ng, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, and Alex Tamai. Become an e knight at patreon.com slash eons to get fun perks like submitting a joke for me to read, like this one from John M. Okay, here we go. What dinosaur likes classic American muscle cars? A Camarosaurus. <laughs> what? A Camarosaurus. Oh, I get it. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more evolutionary escapades. I'm so glad I got to make an Aliens reference in an Eon script after five years. I actually own a replica flight suit from the Nostromo, the first, the ship from the first movie. I wear it on first dates just as a vibe check. <laughs> Yeet! <laughs>